But here's the big difference. Right now, we have three forms of temptation that really we struggle with. Number one, we have Satan that tempts us. He comes against us. He's the enemy of our soul, the accuser of the brother. Satan comes against us. But he'll be bound in a thousand years. He'll be in the pit. No longer will men and women have to deal with the temptations of Satan. Number two, we have an evil world system that tempts us. What do I mean by that? The, the striving after uh, pursuing of wealth and fame and fortune. That won't be going on. The evil world system, which is called Babylon, the great prostitute, the great whore Babylon, will be destroyed at the end of the, of the tribulation. So we won't be tempted. People will not be tempted by Satan. They won't be tempted by an evil world system. Well, where's the temptation going to come from? James chapter 2 talks about it. Excuse me. James chapter 1 talks about it. It says, each man is tempted when he is carried away by his own lusts. We'll still, those people who live during that time, will still have to struggle with their own fleshly desires. Let me say this. Those of us who are, are in the church today that are resurrected to Christ, we will receive glorified bodies. We will not struggle with sin. We will be free from sin. We will be living above sin. We will be living in glorified bodies. I'm talking about people who come through the tribulation, people who are living in their natural bodies, those who are born during the, uh, the, the, tr the millennial reign, born in their natural bodies. They will still be struggling against their flesh. They will still need the blood of Jesus to cleanse them from all unrighteousness but the three things in this flesh that we, we struggle with the lust of the eyes the lust of the flesh what our flesh desires and the big one the boastful pride of life and when Satan comes at the end of that thousand years, the boastful pride of life, I'm tired of living under the rule of the king. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? And as many as the sand of the seashore, I don't know how many that is, but I got to believe it's in the billions, <laughs> come on, are going to go after the prince of darkness. And God is going to rain down fire and brimstone upon them and they will be destroyed. Children born, people living through the millennium. Life will apparently continue much as it does today. There will probably still be cars and trains and planes and, and there will still be uh, heat to put in your home, electricity and gas and all the things. This natural earth will be continuing on. It will simply be better. It will be glorified. It will be more prosperous than ever before. Zephaniah chapter 3 uh, verse 9 hints that there will be one language. It, it, it depends on how you read it. I, I don't, I'm not standing behind that absolutely, but some believe that there will be one language throughout the whole world, that there won't be different languages from place to place. Uh, Amos chapter 9 verse 13 talks about an overabundance of crops. It says that the plowman will overtake the reaper. In other, in other words, while one man's plowing to start harvest or start planting the harvesters not far out in front of him still taking up the harvest because there's so much harvest and then the harvesters coming right behind the plow is just one right after the other because the earth will be so fruitful there will be an abundance uh, there won't be a, a, a want I don't believe during the time of the millennial kingdom some have said and I believe it is true the millennial kingdom of Christ will almost be heaven almost be heaven I'm telling you I'm looking forward to the millennial reign of Christ I very much am now here's the big question though that I want to move into next question that maybe many of you have okay the tribulation's over Jesus has, has proved who he is why why are why are we having the millennial kingdom why is this going to take place there's four different reasons that I came up with others may have others or other reasons but first of all a fulfillment of prophecy the millennial reign of Christ was part of God's plan from the very beginning and the prophecies go way back in time the first prophecies about the millennial reign it's part of God's plan it's part of God's promise to God's people 
people throughout history that there will be a time when the righteous king will reign upon this earth, that God will rule on this earth. So God is going to keep his word. Amen? So number one, a fulfillment of prophecy. Number two, a reward to Israel who are God's chosen people. And I want you to understand the term chosen people because I think most of us see the word chosen people as somebody who is elite. They're better than everybody else. That's not it at all. That's not what the chosen means. God went to his tool shed and he said, I need something to do the job I've got at hand. I'm picking this one. I choose this one. Not because it was the best or the greatest tool in the shed, but God said, I'm going to choose this one. That's what he did with Abraham. Abraham was a guy who worshipped false gods in the land of Ur. But God came to him and said, if you believe me, I will choose you to bring about my plan of salvation. And that became the people of Israel. God said, you will be my instrument. I choose to use you as my instrument. So they aren't chosen in the sense that they were somebody special. They have become somebody special because God made them that way. God chose them. And they have a reward coming because they have been used by God to accomplish the plan of salvation that God has for mankind. It began with the Old Testament law and the prophets. The Bible says they were tutors to us who are now living in the church age. That the law and the prophets were tutors. They were trainers who taught us what righteousness is all about. The birth, the life, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. How did that come about? It came through the people of Israel. The Old Testament prophets, the law, came through Israel. The church and its mission started with the people of Israel. And because they were used for God's purpose, he has promised a reward to them and it will be fulfilled in the Messianic kingdom when Israel will rise up to become the greatest nation in all the world. It will be a glorified kingdom of Israel that the world has never seen before. God has made promises that have yet to be fulfilled. But I want you to think about this. I believe Israel deserves a reward as well because they have been the focus of satanic attacks throughout history. Satan has done his best to wipe them out because Satan knew that they were his chosen instrument to bring about the plan of salvation. And he has done everything. Still today, we have nations in the Middle East who are still saying death to Israel, death to Israel. That is nothing but a satanic attack. But as well, the people of Israel, the Jews, have suffered punishment and prejudice everywhere they have lived throughout the world. Hitler, Germany. But that's not the only place. Most people don't realize that before Hitler was putting the, the Jews in death camps, Russia was doing the same thing the years before that. The Jews are prejudiced everywhere they have went. Why? Is there something particular about them? Yeah, Satan is bringing his anger out through people to try to destroy them every way he can. And the nation of Israel is going to be rewarded. There's a map that I want to show you that is, is one person's idea of the, the boundaries of Israel they believe will take place during the millennium. First of all, notice this scripture at the bottom here. This is out of Genesis. Genesis 15, 18, it says, In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto your seed I have given this land from the river of Egypt, which must be the Nile River right here, unto the great river, the river Euphrates, which runs right down through there. Now, today Israel is this little gray area right here. That's Israel today. In its greatest times, Israel spread out all oh, about like this circle I'm making here. Taking in Damascus and up into Syria and Jordan, uh, that area. That's probably about as Never has this prophecy been fulfilled in Israel's history. But during the millennial reign, the kingdom of Jesus Christ, the nation of Israel is going to be blessed and it will 
will be a nation that is many, many, many times larger than it is today. It is a time of reward to the people of Israel for all that they have suffered throughout all their history. Thirdly, I believe it is a time of reward to the church. Jesus Christ promised that we would rule and reign with him. We're not going to need to reign in heaven. There will be no one to reign over in heaven. But on the earth, during the millennial reign, we will be ruling and reigning with him. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, two, verse, uh, chapter six verse 2 says this. Do you not know that the saints will judge or rule the world? 2 Timothy 2, 11 and 12 says this. It is a trustworthy statement. This is it. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. And then in Revelation 20, verse 6 that we read today, Blessed and holy is the one who has part in the first resurrection. Over these the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. We will be rewarded for our righteousness in this earth. What, what, you, what your rule is, what your place is in the kingdom will be dependent upon the kind of life you live now. You will have eternity. That is yours. That is the promise. But what reward you will receive will determine the life that you've lived. And as much as my immediate thought is, well, I think of people like Billy Graham or others of that, oh, they're going to have a great reward. Well, I don't think God judges, and the Bible says he doesn't, by what the eye sees or the ear hears. God judges by what's, what goes on in a person's life. And it may be people that we've never heard of who are going to have great places of authority in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. I'm not saying Billy Graham doesn't deserve that or others like him. The Bible does say that, that the 12 uh, apostles will set upon thrones over the 12 tribes of Israel during the millennial reign. So it's going to be a, a time of, of the reward of the church. So notice these four things. The fulfillment of prophecy, the reward to Israel, a re time of reward to the church, and fourthly, a demonstration of God's glory. A time when all mankind from all of history will find out what obedience to God's word can produce. Have you ever read in the book of Deuteronomy, I believe it's chapter 35 and 36, but don't hold me to that. It's in the 30s somewhere. But God says, if you will take the law that I've given you and follow it and, and, and stick to it, all these blessings will be yours. These blessings will pursue you is what it literally says. But if you do not follow this, and the blessings go on in my Bible, if I were to find them, they go down one column and about halfway down another. But then it says, but if you disobey, these will be the curses. And the curses finish that column, turn the page, and they fill up the entire next page. It is amazing the curses that come. But during this time, God is going to demonstrate the glory of his kingdom by saying, see, this is what would have happened had you just listened to me for all the years of history, followed after me, let me show you the glory of what the world could have been. I believe it's going to be a time of the demonstration of God's glory. God's law is for our benefit, for our good. Can I tell you today, some of the things that we are struggling with in our world, and church, I say this in love, I don't say this in condemnation, but the things that we're dealing with, this homosexual agenda is the destruction of of human flesh, the destruction of human beings. Transgenderism is the destruction. Our children are being lied to and led astray. It's the destruction. The things of God's word, lying and cheating and stealing, it brings destruction. It doesn't bring blessing. But when we follow God's law, God's word, God's principles and precepts, it brings blessing. And the time of the millennium will be a time. Though there will be sin in the earth, Jesus is ruling with that rod of iron immediately justice will be served immediately God will bring people into line and, and righteousness will prevail God sent Jesus Christ into our world to save mankind from our sin this fact I found it amazing 
remains true. It remains effective even during a thousand years of reign when Jesus Christ will physically, literally, actually be living and breathing and, and reigning on this earth. Still, the salvation that comes through the name of Jesus Christ. He is the way. Jesus Christ is the truth. Jesus Christ is the life. There is no other name, no other way under heaven, Acts tells us, by which we might be saved. Jesus is the only hope of salvation that we or anyone has. And I want to tell you today, if you're here and you haven't received Jesus Christ, if you're watching by video and you've not received Jesus, I implore you, do it now before it's everlastingly too late. Because when this life is over, our chances of, of accepting Jesus Christ come to an end. Jesus is our only hope throughout all of eternity. Jesus Christ is our only hope. God's great mercy is seen in the fact that throughout history and then through, even throughout the tribulation as we've talked about and then for another thousand years God is giving mankind the opportunity to turn to Jesus Christ. We look at the tribulation and we think God's just having a temper tantrum on the world. No, God is sending forth His wrath with the intention of turning men and women to repentance. And yet the Bible says again and again, they harden their heart and they would not repent. God loves us. We are the centerpiece, the choice of his creation. He loves us so much that he wants to give as many people as possible the opportunity to spend eternity in his presence. Think about that. He is giving us every possible chance. Why? Because we are the desire of God's heart. God's love for us is unbounding. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But God will never force his will on us. Let me tell you today, you have a choice to do whatever you want to do with your life. You have that choice and God will not stop you from doing whatever you will. Now he may put some hindrances out there to try to slow you down, make you think about it. But if you choose, God will not stop you. He gave us a will. And he allows us to choose. Listen, now this sounds crazy. He gives us the privilege to choose to not spend eternity with him. He gives us the ability to exempt ourselves from his presence for all eternity if we so desire by simply rejecting his son, Jesus Christ, as Savior for our lives. Some people say, you know, well, I love God, but I just, I don't like to go to church and I'm just not good at being good. Well, let me tell you this. If you can't love God in this life, how in the world are you ever going to love God in heaven? If you don't like being around God and God's people now, how are you going to be around God's people for eternity? You're not. It's just that's the way it is. You're not. God will not force that upon you. If being around God's people makes you miserable, if being in the presence of God makes you uncomfortable, God will not force that upon you. And you can choose to be exempt from it. But here's the exemption. The only other choice is hell. That's the only other choice. And above all else, listen to me. Hell will be hell more than anything else because of an absolute, absolute separation from God for all eternity. That is hell. No hope. No chance of escape. Imagine a person jumping off the Empire State Building. The worst part of that is not hitting the ground. The worst part is those seconds of falling and knowing you have no hope of rescue. Superman's not going to sweep down. Spider-Man's not going to swing in. You jump off the Empire State Building, you're going to go splat at the bottom. But those are only a few seconds. Imagine eternity with no hope.
to turn to Christ with all that we have. Because He loves us. And He continues to give us opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. Some think that, well, I'll, I'll, I'll change at the end of the, uh, when the tribulation takes place. The chances of living through this life and living through the tribulation are so slim, it's, it's nearly impossible. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time, the Bible says. It is the time to take eternity into consideration and to turn to Jesus Christ with 100% of who you are. For those of us who are living as children of God today, our view of, of what will the millennium be like, it will be a, just a little taste of what heaven is going to be like. We will be under the lordship of Jesus Christ our King. We'll not be susceptible to sin. We'll not be susceptible to sickness or death. We will serve God in righteousness and holiness as his servants, serving in his kingdom, living under his abundant provision and his protection. So let us run this race with everything that we have within us. Let us not hold back. Let there not be, and I'm saying this to me louder than I am to anybody else, let's not get to the end of the race and say, what if, what if I'd have done this, or what if I'd have done that? What if I'd have spoken to that person, or what if I'd have spoken to that person? If you've ever watched the movie Schindler's List, if you've seen that movie, and all that he did that was still the struggle that he had at the end, out of all the people that he saved, all the, if I'd have just given a little more money, if I'd have just done a little bit more, I could have saved just a few more people. Let's not, not let, let us not let our life be filled at the end with the what ifs. There's a world that needs Jesus, and he's coming soon. Will you bow your heads with me today? Your heads bowed, your eyes closed. I do just want to say, if you're here, and I believe most of us, maybe all of us here today are born-again Christians. If you're here, though, and you've not received Jesus, you've not made that commitment, I invite you to do it even now as we pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you. God, I, I look with anticipation to the millennium. Lord, though it, Lord, is on the other side of that great tribulation, Lord, when such devastation will take place and so many will lose their life. Yet, Lord, during the millennium, so many will be saved. So many more will find an opportunity to come into the kingdom of Christ. And Father, for a thousand years, our Lord will reign and this place will be glorious. Father, today I pray that we as saints of God will look to the millennium with great hope and anticipation knowing Lord that you have a place for us in your kingdom to serve to rule to reign Lord as priests and as and as kings in the in this world of that day Lord I pray that we would make others ready that we would share the gospel of Jesus Christ wherever we go the father we would reach out to our family and friends and tell them Jesus loves you Jesus wants to see you saved Jesus wants you to rule in his kingdom hallelujah Jesus has a place for you in his kingdom glory to God father help us to have that message of hope and salvation for those who will hear we love you Lord we pray your blessing over your people this morning God supply every need bring healing Lord to those who are in need and father we pray for your goodness to pursue us day after day in Jesus name we pray amen amen God bless you this morning